Hello and welcome to Enigma Sightings. I'm your host, Alejandro Rojas. I am the head of content and research at Enigma Labs, where we're building an app to record sightings so that researchers can do further analysis so we can have a better understanding of UAP. And we have a special guest today, another pilot, but this time from Europe, from the Netherlands. Um, so help me welcome Christian Van Heist. Hello, Christian. Hi, how are you doing? Great to have you. Doing well. So uh, to start off, maybe you can tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your commercial airline pilot, maybe the routes that you fly, and then uh, what else you like to do? <laughs> uh, well, first of all, thanks for uh, for having me. I think it's wonderful to, uh, to have a non-US pilot talking uh, about these subjects as well, from my European perspective. Anyway, I'm, uh, I'm from the Netherlands. I'm an airline pilot for the last 20 years. I'm currently captain on the 747. Uh, right now, um, I'm flying the 747 for almost 12, 13 years, um, mostly flying to the US, to uh, New York, Atlanta, Houston. We have some uh, routes to Asia, to, uh, to China especially. Uh, but in the past, I've flown the 747 all over the world, from Africa to South America and, and literally across the world. Uh, before that, I flew the 737 across Europe for about four and a half years. And if I go back even further, I started my flying career on the turboprop, small airplane, 50 passengers max. And we were flying all over Europe and Africa and Central Asia. So now, 20 years later, I have about uh, nine and a half thousand flying hours in my logbook. And uh, oh, here we are. And uh, besides that, actually, I have a parallel career next to flying, which is photography. And I always carry my camera with me in the cockpit in my flight bag. Uh, I did that already actually since the first flying lesson. I was just so so amazed with the beautiful views from, from outside of the cockpit that I really wanted to document it. So this uh, eventually grew into the uh, professional career that is next to flying uh, today. So uh, uh, I have the best of both worlds. So I'm a the flying Dutchman with a, with a camera, I guess. <laughs> you know, I love sitting by the window and flying and trying to capture capture the amazing you know views that you see out there and i do such a terrible job and none of the images do <laughs> do uh, what i saw justice but you're just the opposite your photos are so beautiful you not only capture kind of that feeling but even more so um is it is photography something that you've done throughout your life i mean you're so good at it well thanks thanks for the compliments um that's that's really nice to hear uh, basically, no, I was never, never really interested in, in photography until I started flying. And as I said, during the first flying lessons, even, I was just so amazed with the views. It was not just the fact that it was sometimes just beautiful to see, but I realized acutely that the perspective we have from above is literally unique. We're maybe the third generation of human beings to, to be able to fly and see the world, see the planets from, from, from that perspective. And I just, I just, uh, wanted to document it and share it with the rest of the world. So my photography literally started with my first flying lessons and it grew into what it is today. And uh, uh, the funny thing is, especially the with the 747, we were flying literally all over the world and uh, we're seeing so many unique things, especially at night. For example, the a lot of shooting stars, northern lights, uh, the Milky Way, especially if you fly over an area without light pollution. It's just, just amazing. So um, by using my camera, I'm able to to document what we see as pilots and I'm able to to show the rest of the world just how unbelievably beautiful it sometimes is up there. So um, yeah, it's really uh, the best spot to see the world from a unique position. And um, in that sense, actually, we're really lucky uh, sitting in the cockpit because the windows are from much, uh, much better quality than the little cabin windows in the back. So the windows, first of all, they're pretty big. Uh, they're cleaned uh, quite regularly, so it's it's not as, as scratchy as, and as dirty as the windows in the cabin. And besides that, we have an almost uh, 270 degree view around the airplane. So that gives us literally the best platform to to take pictures from. So um, yeah, it is what it is. It, it, it's reached the level that it is now today. Uh, I never did any training or courses on photography, but I just learned on the go. A lot of mistakes, a lot of uh, pictures that didn't turn out as, as I hoped them to be. But nowadays, uh, after 20 years, of experience uh, in, in, in photography and especially the challenging sides of photography, um, I'm able to document and capture basically anything that I uh, that I wish to to capture and share with the rest of the world. So, mm -hmm. yeah, there there we are. Twenty years of, of flying and photography. 
Well, thank you. That was very gracious of you to offer up an excuse for me. It's just the windows. If I had better exactly. windows, I'd, I'd have better photos. I think there's some talent involved. But um, getting on to the topic at hand, uh, pilots having that platform, a very unique platform in the sky. And of course, um, the topic of what we're talking about being, you know, aerial phenomena. Do you feel that pilots are especially, you know, are, are better observers than average for spotting UAP? Yeah, I, I think in general. Uh, first of all, uh, we're sitting in the cockpit uh, with a with a unique view. As I just uh, mentioned, we have large windows. We can see things that, that hardly anyone else can see. But apart from that, I think it's very important to keep in mind that pilots are always concerned with flight safety. We're always... Uh, observing the world around us with a with a, with a, with an eye to detect anything that could pose a threat to the airplane. So let's say if I'm flying at night and I see some flashing lights, I see some moving lights. My first reaction is to look at it and maybe to identify if it's an airplane or if it's some other traffic close by, or maybe even lightning because sometimes uh, some thunderstorms they can become active pretty uh, suddenly. So I'm always tuned, and like most pilots, actually all the pilots, to to identify potential hazards. And that makes us um, trained observers because we constantly scan for those kind of things. I've seen uh, thousands of airplanes, so I can recognize different contrails, different airplanes. I've seen a lot of weather phenomena. I can I can identify different kind of, of lightning and clouds, etc. So I'm very experienced in, in, in looking out of the window uh, with a flight safety aspect in mind. And actually the last thing that, um, that I'm thinking about, and I guess this applies to, to maybe all the airline pilots, commercial pilots, is uh, that we try to find a very rational explanation for what we're seeing. And a UFO is most of the time, it's, it's, it's not even an option because 99.9% .9 of all the things that we see can be can be identified. So in general, that makes us trained observers because we're professionals at work and we uh, we have the safety of the airplane always uh, as a priority. Mm -hmm. That you make a lot of great points there, but given what you just told us, how you're used to, you know, looking for potential air safety issues, identifying those issues, dealing with them, whether that be calling the tower or what have you. So maybe go through, because I know you've had a few and we'll get more into them. But the first instance where you saw something where these processes are going on in your mind, you know, what could this be? Could it be this? Could it be that? But you just couldn't come to an answer. Um, maybe you could walk us through that first UAP sighting. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, the funny thing is the first UAP sighting, I'm, I'm not even sure if it's a UAP because, uh, frankly, I have no clue what it is, uh, was just after I finished my uh, my training as a, as a co-pilot on the first job I had. So I was very inexperienced in, in flying, especially flying commercial airliners. And uh, I was a co-pilot on this turboprop. We were flying over southern Germany. Uh, it was late evening or maybe uh, maybe already at night. Anyway, it was, it was uh, very dark and we were flying between two cloud layers and all of a sudden I'm looking in the direction of my captain maybe he was even an instructor it could be that I was still in training um, and through his window I see a really bright light just extremely bright light falling vertically down actually moving down is a better word because it, it, it had quite a high uh, speed or velocity and it was falling down vertically it was illuminating the cloud layer below before it fell through and it just disappeared from sight and I remember my 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 captain or instructor saying well, wow, that's that's weird. That's funny. And for a long time, I I was wondering what it was, but I thought, you know, I'm just new to the job, and I'll probably see this stuff every every once in a while, and maybe I can even identify it at one point. Um, but in 18 years' time, I haven't seen any kind of weather phenomena, anything anything else that could explain this 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 vertically moving light. Um, so that was my first sighting, and as I said, I was I was kind of naive, and I thought this is probably something that I can identify later on, but I've never been able to find a, a, a solid uh, explanation for it and interestingly enough uh, another UAP sighting I had was back in 2000 uh, I don't know 2008 or 9 maybe I, I, I have to look up the dates but it was almost identical it was the same uh, same kind of light a, a really bright light moving vertically down in this case we saw it from the uh, Boeing 737 during day, there was a perfectly blue sky there was no clouds whatsoever no, no, no thunderstorms anywhere around 
and we saw this really bright light, maybe 20 miles ahead of us, just slightly off the of our, of our course. And it was falling vertically into the Adriatic Sea. I, I couldn't see if, uh, a splash or anything um, happening on the surface of the ocean or the water because it, it, it was pretty far away. But it was a bright light moving at exactly the same speed or rate maybe as the first time I saw it. Uh, there was, uh, as I said, there was a couple of years after after my first sighting, and then I really realized that it was it was kind of peculiar. And the same reaction from my captain again. I remember she was saying, "Well, that's strange." So twice I've seen something that is that was very similar, and twice the reaction from my from my colleague was a surprise actually. So. As I said before, I always try to identify what I'm seeing. I'm trying to uh, to 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 recognize other airplanes to see if there's maybe traffic ahead of us, maybe military activity. It could be a rocket launch, or it could be could be um, as, uh, some people pointing lasers at, at the cockpit because they want to blind the pilots. But in this case, it was so weird. It was it was moving so strange that um, I was unable to identify it. And I've always been been uh, basically left with a question mark on, on on what it was. And I. Um, Especially now, later in in my career, I really want to know uh, what else is in the sky because it's it's it could be a potential safety hazard. So yeah, mm-hmm. long story short, I, these are the two sightings that uh, that really took me uh, by surprise. I no, no clue what it was. After that first sighting, so you're you know newly trained, uh, a new pilot. Were did you share that sighting with anybody? No, no, and I didn't really um, take it serious. I didn't. It, it didn't really struck me as something uh, anomalous, actually. So for a long time, I was I was thinking about it. I might have told maybe some of my colleagues, like, "Oh, I've seen this. Do you know what it is?" Um, but no, nobody was able to come up with a solution. And frankly, I didn't really uh, think about it that much. It was always in the back of my mind, always wondering what it could have been. Maybe, maybe some kind of a uh, ball lightning or something else. But yeah, basically, it was just in the back of my mind, and I didn't really give it any uh, any attention anymore. And the same actually applies to to most of the of the uh, let's say UAP sightings I had in the past. Um, as I said, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm always thinking about what it could have been. It was always kind of in the back of my mind. But, um, yeah, you just leave it at one point and you don't think about it anymore. And it was actually after I saw the interviews with uh, Commander David Fravor and Lieutenant Ryan Graves that I realized that even these military pilots are sometimes seeing things that they cannot explain and they try to approach it in the same rational way. And it was only – this must have been late 2020. It was only at that moment um, – that slowly my own sightings and experiences came back to the surface again, and I started to to question them again in a in a different uh, perspective. Mm-hmm. Interesting. You know, you bring up uh, David Fravor, who was uh, one of the jet fighter pilots who engaged uh, the object that was seen in the Nimitz event, which was what, like two thousand four. Ryan Grave, a Navy pilot uh, who was involved with incidents in about the 2012, 2015 kind of area. But in the Nimitz situation, they actually caught the objects on radar at first, and they described something similar to what you're describing, Um, objects that were seen um, at a high altitude that dropped very quickly. Um, That's what they were seeing on radar in the Nimitz before they they scrambled the jets, and uh, David Fravor was able to kind of engage that large Tic Tac object. Well, what, what what struck me as well is uh, in the um, I think it was Commander David Traver who mentioned that the object was not only seen but also uh, uh, tracked by radar and apparently it fell um, from eighty thousand feet to sea level and apparently what I what I understood is that the eighty thousand feet was the upper limit of the of the radar system uh, so it showed up at eighty thousand feet on the radar and it just fell down but it could have been actually originating from much higher because the the radar just probably didn't didn't register it uh, beyond that um, for me personally I only saw the object falling vertically down, but it only became visible once it passed, uh, um, let's say, into sight from the upper window frame. So it could have been originating from um, maybe slightly higher. It could have been originating from low Earth orbit. I have absolutely no clue. That the only thing that, that we can see is basically the, the world through little slits like, like like the cockpit windows we have. So, um, yeah, where it originated and, and how, how high it's, 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 it started to fall down, I have no clue. But it sounded very, very uh, similar to what, to what he uh, uh, explained here. Yeah. And uh, just so the audience is aware, too, when we use the term UAP, um, I'm essentially using it the same way that uh, the Arrow has been using it or the the government and Congress has talked about it, which is something that is 
immediately unidentifiable. Doesn't mean it won't be identified. It just means, you know, it's something that we currently can't identify. And then sometimes after investigation still can't identify like the Nimitz incident or with these recent Chinese balloons, you know, with the Chinese balloon, we were able to identify that. So there is a distinction that's important just so the audience is aware. But moving on to your other UAP sightings, how many have you had in all? In all, I have four sightings that I still cannot explain. Uh, as you uh, as you mentioned just just before, there might be a moment that some of them can be explained. And I'm happy to to hear the uh, the, the explanations for anything that that we're seeing. But all in all, I have four sightings that were significantly enough to uh, to pose as a as, as a UAP. I must say, I've seen some some funny things sometimes in the sky that I haven't been able to identify, but. Um, they could easily be something that that uh, that 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 are pretty mundane. So, for example, to give you, um, uh, once or twice, I've seen some stars uh, just just disappearing all of a sudden uh, at night, and it sounds kind of interesting. But um, I'm I'm really I'm, uh, I'm I, I, I do think it's sometimes sometimes something something prosaic, like maybe um, a geostationary satellite that's reflecting light until it's just maybe tumbling or turning, and then it, it doesn't reflect sunlight anymore, and it could show up as a as a star in the night sky and disappear. So these things, are, let's say, they're still unexplained, but um, I don't see any any UAP. Um, uh, explanation for it, but that having said that, so there are still four things that I've that I've seen that that defy an explanation. So, including mm-hmm. the, the two lights that we just uh, talked about, the falling lights. And did you report any of them? Um, no, actually, this, uh, well, reporting um, twice, I've asked uh, air traffic control if there was any military activity, and I told air traffic control what we were seeing. Um, once it was, this was actually the the vertically moving lights uh, over Greece. The controller basically replied that there was no military activity, there's no traffic, and he just handed us off to the next uh, air, uh, air traffic controller. He was absolutely not interested, and he just dis- dismissed it basically. Another sighting, we can talk about that more in detail later. I did mention it to air traffic control that we saw a solid object far ahead of us and that air traffic controller over spain took it very serious he was asking us what we saw what kind of distance we could we could we could see the object and he asked us to to contact the military air traffic controller over spain uh, he immediately was very interested this military guy and basically he confirmed that there was no other traffic and absolutely no activity no weather balloons just absolutely nothing around us in a thousand mile radius at least ahead of us so um long story short yeah i mentioned it twice to air traffic control and once it was just dismissed and the second time it was taken very serious um it doesn't really um yeah it doesn't really mean uh, reporting for example we don't have any systems in place in 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 the world or in in, let's say in aviation uh where we can report these kind of sightings and uh, every airline including uh, my airline they have a really solid safety system so if there's anything safety related uh, that could could potentially pose a problem. We can make a report about it, and then the company starts to investigate. It could maybe change procedures, or uh, you 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 name it. There's a there, there's a whole system behind it. But something like a UAP, and especially if it's not a, a direct threat to the airplane, it's not something that an airline can do anything with. Uh, it's like reporting to my chief partner that I saw the northern lights. Well, he said he's probably going to reply like, "Well, yeah, happy for you, but." That's it's completely useless for us. Uh, so in that sense, um, I didn't officially report it anywhere. And um, yeah, um, also I'm, I'm, as, as a as a non UAP enthusiast, especially for those first few years, um, I didn't even know where to where to start with, with with reporting something like this. So I guess there are a lot of pilots who have seen things um, that they would like to have an explanation for, but they have no clue where to report something like this or um, uh, where it could be investigated properly. Yeah, that really interesting. I think we'll get more into kind of perceptions on the topic um, and other struggles that way uh, in just a minute. But I guess next, I would love to hear about those other two sightings. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, it, 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 I guess it makes uh, the whole picture a bit more complete. Uh, the, the other sighting was back in, um, I don't have the dates now here with me. I think it was in 2006 uh, or 2005. Anyway, it was also um, with a with a turboprop I was flying, and we were flying it over Greece. 
at uh, one point we flew from Athens to all these little islands over there and I think we landed in the island called uh, Mykonos it was in the evening or at least at night the sun was already down beautiful starry sky and after landing we had to make a 180 turn on the runway to taxi back to the to the little terminal it's it's really small airports they have there and the moment we turned we basically the airplane was facing due north and we were just turning Suddenly, there in the night sky ahead of us, and my captain and I, we both saw it, a really bright dot of light appeared. It's like, um, it's difficult to to say what it looked like. It was like a really bright planet that you sometimes see in the night sky, like like Jupiter or Venus. It was, it was very bright, and it was about the same size, I guess, but more solid. So it wasn't really glowing like some of the planets uh, appear for the human eye, but it was a really solid white light. It appeared... And it disappeared. It reappeared three more times. So in total, we saw it in a stuttering motion, uh, appearing and reappear, reappearing four times um, at, a, at, a, at a let's say a distance about uh, four times the width of the, of the full moon. And then all of a sudden, it reappeared again a little bit further away, and it shot off at incredible speed. And it didn't even accelerate. It was just instantaneous, incredible speed. How fast it was going is impossible to judge because uh, we don't know how high it was or how far away it is. And to, to judge speed, you have to know how uh, how far away it is. But let's say, um, because actually we could see with, with our eyes uh, that it, whatever it was, it was far away. So as, as I explained to you before, we as pilots are always looking out of the window trying to judge speed and, and altitude of other traffic and other uh, clouds maybe um, around us. In this case, we could see it was it was far away, but if it was at 20,000 feet, 30,000 feet, or maybe even low Earth orbit, absolutely no clue. But let's say if, if, if it was another airplane, if it was flying let's say at 30,000 feet, which is a normal normal altitude for uh, commercial traffic, the instantaneous speed would have been uh, Mach 30, I guess. So it's about 30 times uh, the speed of sound, wow. which is, uh, to my understanding, uh, it's it's a high, um, it's, it's such, such a high speed that there's not even any um, technology that can, that can produce that kind of acceleration and, and speed yet. So I was really, really surprised. A little fun factor, um, that night there was a huge... Uh, part of the airspace closed just south of Greece uh, in the Mediterranean. And that was because the U.S. carrier group with the USS Theodore Roosevelt was passing by. As pilots, we get those uh, uh, no temps. It's a whole list of, of um, let's say, uh, navigational issues that we have to keep in mind, airspace closure, um, some airports which are closed, runway maintenance, etc. So we knew from these no temps that there was a huge airspace closure just south of us. Uh, we have no clue where the, uh, where the carrier group is exactly. We just know that part of the airspace is, is closed off for us. So when we saw that light, and as I said, my captain and I, we both saw the light, the first reaction was like, wow, that's, that was strange, but it's probably something military. And that's always the go-to answer for us, at least most of the commercial pilots, um, that it, it must be something military. Because we have no clue what kind of uh, fancy uh, toys the, the US military has or maybe is testing out. It could be a rocket or it could, could be something else. I have no clue. But it always struck me because even if it was something uh, something military, Wow, that was really something else, especially the instant speed and and, and incredible sp uh, uh, yeah speed it was, it was shooting off. I've never seen anything since, and it's uh, it it was really um, really impressive. And mm -hmm. interestingly enough, um, I've read three other reports from um, from um, I think it was from the book uh, UFOs and Nukes from Robert uh, Robert Hastings and some uh, military uh, U.S. military personnel at these missile silos in uh, Montana. I think they saw. Or actually, they described exactly the same thing. A bright light stuttering, moving or stuttering four times before it's shooting off at incredible speed. You know, I was thinking um, the Roosevelt, first of all, it's interesting that was nearby because that's the 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 group that uh, Ryan Graves was with. So he was on. I don't know if he was on the ship yet, but he no, was. No, he wasn't. I, I asked him. I, I mean, I spoke with him. Yeah. Oh, right, right. So um, so that's kind of an interesting coincidence. But also just that, uh, you know, it makes me think it's kind of funny. A lot of countries kind of feel that way. And I've heard a lot of, you know, UK investigations where they're like, oh, that must be the Americans. But uh, our military has got to be pretty happy with that, that the rest of the world thinks that we might have something as incredibly sophisticated as that um and, and so it's kind of funny you know that you mention that you know a lot of times people think oh that's got to be military um and 
So then those reports don't get reported. And yet, you know, as we come to find our military in the U.S. was having the same sort of experiences. Um, and I think on the records, you know, there uh, there's a lot of similar reports to what you have uh, witnessed. So it's certainly a mystery. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And it's uh um I think it's always good to, to keep in mind that a lot of these things are seen by 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 pilots, uh, sometimes even taken serious, but they're always being dismissed. So I think it's very important that this topic becomes um more uh, how do you say this? Like it, it has to get out of the fringe uh, uh area and we have to be able to 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 identify um yeah different things, either military or not. But some some of the lights we see, uh even some some of my colleagues have seen physical objects, uh, they're definitely not uh not not mainstream military military toys so i i think it's very important for um yeah for many pilots to realize that that not everything can be can be dismissed as military mm -hmm. so getting into the force sighting one thing i think is interesting to note is i mean you fly a lot right you're up there a lot uh, about how many and, and the point i'm trying to make is that um even though you have four sightings which is certainly higher than average you spend a lot of time in the air. So it's not like you're seeing them a lot. This four still represents, you know, one out of very many flights, right? Yeah. And interestingly enough, it's only um, uh, during the first, uh, let's say, the first five years of my career that I've seen some some things I cannot explain. Uh, mm -hmm. I've been flying the 747 now for uh, for almost 12 years and uh, or actually over 12 years now. And I haven't seen anything UAP related or anything strange uh, that I that I cannot find a mundane explanation for in the last 12 years, uh, which is interesting because now actually I'm flying long haul distances literally uh, <laughs> around the world. So, yeah. I um, it was especially in the first three thousand hours of my flying career that I that I saw these uh, these sightings, and um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's difficult to pinpoint the amount of of, of sightings per uh, per flying career, maybe or per uh, per thousand hours. And also well, my colleagues, they have seen really interesting things, um, and um, yeah. Some of them they have they haven't seen anything. I mean, it's some pilots they're not even looking out of the window. So yeah, it's it's impossible to see anything then. But it it really depends. I have a fourth sighting as well, which is the only one that I was able to document with my camera. Was in January two thousand ten. Uh, yeah, it was in January two thousand ten when we were flying with a seven three seven Boeing seven three seven passenger airliner from Amsterdam to Malaga in the south of Spain. Um, for those uh, who are familiar with uh, with Europe, Spain is the, is it it's part of the huge Iberian Peninsula in the south of Europe, and it's about I guess fifteen hundred miles or fourteen hundred miles from north to south. Anyway, it was already evening. The sun uh, was already setting below the horizon, and there was just this beautiful orange yellow uh, hue in the sky ahead of us. And all of a sudden, my captain, he was a very senior guy, he's asking me. Hey, do you see that object as well ahead of us? And I really had to had to, uh, had to had to do my best. And all of a sudden, I saw really far in the in the in the distance ahead of us a small, um, flat, dark object ahead of us, and um, which was really strange because uh, I'll give you the, the the context. The moment we entered the Spanish air, airspace, the air traffic controller cleared us direct to Malaga which means that we're leaving the airway that all the commercial traffic is normally using and we were just in a in a, a random route let's say directly to the airport of, of malaga um and so the moment we saw this 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 object ahead of us we were really wondering if we were looking at another airplane because we were flying there on the on the on the on a non-standard route and it would be uh, quite a surprise to see another airplane ahead of us also we were flying at forty-one thousand feet which is which is quite high for uh, regular traffic, and there are not too many uh, commercial airplanes are flying at the same altitude or even higher. But the object we saw was above the horizon, quite far above the horizon, and it means that it must have been flying much higher than we were flying. Uh, let's say roughly around uh, sixty thousand feet, if it was some airplane ahead of us, let's say thirty or forty miles ahead of us. So we re we were really intrigued in 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 this object, and we we're really wondering what it could have been. Uh, we didn't have any traffic on our navigation display. We have all, all commercial airplanes, and also I think even military airplanes. They have this uh, TCAS system, which stands for Traffic Collision Avoidance System, and it shows all the traffic around us in a mile, let's say in a in a in an eighty mile radius around the uh, uh, around our airplane. Um, 
as, as little dots and it gives the information about the, the altitude of the other traffic ahead of us. But in this case, there was absolutely no TCAS traffic on our navigation displays. So whatever it was, it was flying uh, very high and it didn't have any TCAS on it if it was, let's say, within uh, within 80 nautical miles uh, of our airplane. So I was looking at it, and maybe after 10 minutes, I just decided to ask the air traffic controller if there was any traffic ahead of us, because it didn't look like uh, any any other airplane I've ever seen. And the Madrid air traffic controller, he replied immediately that, uh, no, he didn't have any other traffic ahead of us, and he was asking us what we saw. So I explained to him, it's like, there's a solid object ahead of us. It was backlit, so we could see that it, it was at least within our atmosphere. Uh, it was a solid object ahead of us. It was not moving a uh, relative distance of our airplane, and it seemed quite high. So we were just interested in what kind of airplane it could have been, because it's we're all pilots, we're all interested in, in airplanes, and, uh, and, and especially the exotic once flying really high and he explained that there was no known traffic but he asked us actually he urged us to contact military air traffic controller uh, on a different frequency and tell him about our sighting so this was getting um uh, more interesting. So uh, I, I tuned in the other uh, frequency on a different radio, and I talked with the military air traffic controller, and he was really interested in what we saw. He was he was interested in 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 the, in the object, in the relative distance, bearing, uh, if it was moving, if we if we if we could see it uh, changing shape, maybe. Uh, absolutely nothing. Which I, basically, I told him, you know, we just see something ahead of us. And we have no clue what it is. So we were wondering what kind of airplane uh, could reach that that kind of altitude and, and has that shape. And basically, he replied to us. He said, no, there's absolutely no traffic ahead of you, not military, not civil. There are no weather balloons. There's simply absolutely nothing ahead of you. Uh, so he was really interested in what we saw, but he couldn't offer an explanation. So for the next uh, 55 minutes, more or less, we were flying on a direct routing to, uh, to Malaga until we descended into the clouds during our approach for the airport. I was able to take uh, two pictures of the object, and uh, I'm the first to admit that this uh, this picture is kind of uh, uh, fake and underwhelming, but the fact that we uh, that we saw it for such a long time, it was flying at that altitude, makes it uh, makes it an interesting uh, picture. And also a fun fact: the uh, the file, the, the photo file, is now being analyzed by uh, members of uh, IPACO, which is a French organization uh, run by by people who are always also working for uh, Gaipan. And um, yeah, they're analyzing the image to see what it what it could have been. They have uh, specialized software to to analyze these kind of pictures. And what what made it really interesting for me was the fact that military air traffic control was very interested in it for in the first place, and that he confirmed that there was absolutely no known traffic ahead of us. Because if I wouldn't have had that feedback from the military air traffic controller, um, I probably would have shrugged my shoulders and 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 not think anything of it but the fact that they were really uh, really on top of it and he wanted to know all the details uh, told me that uh, he took it serious and that, that was quite interesting mm -hmm. really really strange you know what's interesting is that the more um interesting cases like that one um seem to typically entail objects that uh, are in the distance um as opposed to and so they don't necessarily pose an immediate um, flight safety issue, um, which could be why this subject's been ignored for so long. Um, Chile is actually a country where they've gathered some experts to talk about the intention and do these things pose uh, a flight safety issue. And they decided no, that really the biggest issue is, is the distraction. Um, which is kind of interesting, especially given that um, most recently, uh, this situation that happened in the U.S. with the Chinese balloon and then the other object shot down, um, they were shot down because they did pose a threat in that they were in the, you know, 30 to 40,000 uh, altitude range, which is right where commercial airlines are. Um, so it's kind of an interesting dynamic in that looking for UAP, we kind of expose that perhaps there's more in that air safety range floating around than we expected, but not the weird stuff. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And in that sense, I'm actually very happy um, with the news coverage by the mainstream media about these balloons, because uh, first of all, it's uh, it's interesting to see what's happening now worldwide. It's uh, it's an interesting uh, uh, development on the, on, the, on, the, on the world theater. Uh, but for the first time, I was... I, 
basically I saw a confirmation on the mainstream media that there are things floating in the sky. And I guess that um, some UAP sightings, maybe even a lot of them, uh, could be tracked down to to those kind of balloons being spotted by pilots. And instead of um, laughing about pilots seeing something, now we basically know that there is stuff floating in the air, sometimes even at the same altitudes that airplanes are flying. So I think it's, um, it's suddenly taken very serious because uh, we physically have objects that could pose a threat, not just for national security, but also flight safety. So it's a, it's an interesting development. And I'm really happy to see that uh, this basically, if this happens right now, and we're slowly losing the um, uh, the fun factor about the UAP, and, and it's 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 serious. It's a serious topic. Mm-hmm. And, you know, with your last sighting, especially, um, it's really tough to come up with what that might be other than what you all kind of often default to, which is some high tech, you know, secret project. Um, and if it's not that, what is it? That's what, you know, is so interesting. I, I think that, um, and maybe you would agree, we still haven't gotten to the point besides Fravor's case where the media has really picked up on some of these more um, exciting and mysterious situations like yours, because certainly, you know, those uh, all four of your sightings, those were not balloons. No, no, definitely. Uh, the lights, they were they were uh, peculiar. They were moving. I'm not even saying falling, but they were moving at, at, at really high speeds. The, the stuttering and shooting light was was very strange as well. Um, and this this object over Spain was uh, was in a completely different category. And I must say, what makes it so tricky, and uh, this is uh, this is this is a valid point for a lot of debunkers and people who are skeptics. Um, it's very difficult for me to to judge the size and and distance and altitude of these of these. Uh, lights or objects. For example, the 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 Spain over sorry the object over Spain. If let's say if it was another airplane flying twenty or thirty miles ahead of us, um, it 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 could have been uh, the size of maybe a seven forty seven or something like that. But then again, as I explained before, uh, for me as a pilot, it doesn't make sense that it, that it wasn't air, another airplane. Then again, if it was an object that was maybe um, maybe over Africa, maybe two, three thousand miles ahead of us, it must have been huge, and it must have been at extreme altitude. It's it's, it's strange, you know. If if all the pilots were seeing exactly the same things all the time, it would be easy to draw a conclusion. My sightings are actually pretty mundane. I have some some colleagues who came forward to me with their own sightings, and they describe really, really different things. So sometimes even um, objects pretty close to the airplane. It's 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 just it seems to be a, a, a very varied um, phenomena, whatever it is. And there, mm-hmm. and actually, I, I think we uh, we're not even talking about one phenomena. I think we're talking about many different kind of things. Uh, I, I I still think that some of the sightings that are being made by pilots um, are a genuine military tech that's being tested or being flown. Um, I, I think some of the sightings are spy balloons or weather balloons. I mean, it, there, there's a lot of stuff happening that's that's not open to the general public to know, and, uh, and that's that's fine with me. I guess uh, some of the sightings, maybe even lights, etc., could be down to. Uh, uh, let's say a weather phenomena, maybe maybe a ball lightning, something that doesn't happen often, but that that can still be seen and um, and misidentified. But then again, there are still some things, including the the, the stuttering and shooting light that I mentioned before, that is still uh, an, a genuine unknown to me. And I think we have to be open to uh, to 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 realizing that there might be might be stuff out there that we that we simply cannot identify right now. Mm-hmm. Now, when you reported, was there any sort of ridicule or are you all um, dissuaded uh, by your airline from reporting things or, or talking to the public about these issues? No, no. I uh, also because, uh, frankly, I, d- I never reported it to the airline. These these lights that we saw, the uh, even even the object that we saw over Spain, it never posed a threat to us. So there was no no need to report anything. Let's say if there was an object, uh, maybe no, another airplane, or even even a balloon flying at our altitude, or if if it was something that we barely missed. Uh, and maybe air traffic control was just dismissing it. This would be a reason for me to to file a report saying, well, we we almost had a had a collision with a with a solid object in the sky. It has to be investigated. Um, but these kind of things that I've been seeing, there is no way no, no way to report it. So my airline never knew about it. Uh, among pilots, it, it's it's not really a topic we talk about often. Um, it's it's 
partially the fear of uh, ridicule that's 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 keeping people from talking about it uh, partially because uh, some of my colleagues are simply not open to it they just say well it, whatever it is is probably something military or it's it's a rocket or they just don't even want to discuss it uh, but it's only um it's it's actually an interesting uh, an interesting one. In 2014, I uh, witnessed and documented a huge group of red lights over the Pacific Ocean. We were flying from Hong Kong to Anchorage, and uh, it was just a, a massive patch of, of, of bright, glowing uh, red and orange lights in the uh, in the ocean below us. And uh, we were absolutely baffled. We had no clue what it was. Maybe an, an underwater volcano erupting or uh, whatever it was. I took a lot of pictures, and I. I think I put them on Facebook back then, and it 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 went viral. It was picked up by a couple of journalists, and they wrote articles like "Pilot is looking at underwater UFO base," and "Pilot is is documenting UFOs." And uh, honestly, UFOs or whatever alien, I mean, it was not even remotely in the back of my mind. I was just trying to find maybe an explanation for 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 the formation of new islands over bioluminescence, whatever. I, I don't didn't really care. Um, but it was interesting to see that the media was was immediately labeling it as something alien UFO related. And the first thing that went through my mind was, oh, now I'm going to be the, the laughing stock of the company. You know, now now all of my <laughs> colleagues are going to make fun of me in a in a lighthearted way, but I was I was expecting to be mocked by, by a lot of colleagues. And funny enough, it never happened. Um some people made fun of me, but it was mostly people I don't know, uh, and that that, that weren't even there. Um, as it's still in a, in, a, in, a, in a nice way, by the way. But a lot of my colleagues took it really serious, and they were really thinking together with me to find the, the cause of what happened. Also, um, it, what really helps is that most of my colleague know, colleagues know me as a as, as a professional pilot. I'm, I'm down to earth. Uh, they know me for my photography, and they know I'm, I'm I'm serious about 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 my job, basically about my profession. So it was interesting to see, first of all, that none of my colleagues were making fun of it, and later. When I was flying with some colleagues, or or maybe even having dinner at uh, at, at, a, at a destination, some of my colleagues were starting to open up about their own experiences with, about what they've seen. Uh, by the way, these red lights we found out, or I found out basically two years ago, that it was a really boring uh, fishing fleet of uh, mackerel, or sorry, a Chinese fishing fleet uh, operating in the Pacific. So it's it's very man-made, and uh, it was just spectacular to see, but it was uh, it had very prosaic nature. Uh, but regardless, it was interesting to see that a lot of my colleagues were were slowly sharing some of their own sightings with me that they couldn't explain, and of which some of them are really compelling. Um, so it showed me that um, many pilots are, are um, let's say, slowly opening up to 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 some of the things we've seen in the air, and it's it's partially the stigma around UFOs uh, that's that, that that's preventing people from talking about it, but it's also partially the um, the fact that some some pilots they don't want to be seen as as unprofessional, or some pilots just just don't want to admit that there's something seen or 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 uh, a witness that they couldn't couldn't explain possibly. With all of this excitement um, in the U.S. over this topic, um, has that reached you know Europe? Are, are, are people kind of and pilots in particular? more interested in getting to the root of this issue out there and following uh, the Americans? Or what is the sentiment? Good question. I think in general, uh, a lot of people, the, they regard the UAP topic still as a as a, as a a purely American topic. Um, a lot of movies about, uh, let's say, aliens or, or science fiction movies, they always depict the United States. Um, and it's, it's, it's simply not taking, t- taking that serious. Fortunately, uh, as we both know, since about 2017, the UAP topic is uh, is slowly being docu- uh, being told by uh, the mainstream media, um, still with a kind of ridicule factor. But here and there, some people are picking it up. But I must say, in general, it's not really a topic that that I hear many of my colleagues talking about. And I think uh, here in Europe, um, it's like a niche uh, sector for, uh, for 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 the media to talk about. It's not really discussed that, uh, that 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 openly. And it's only, as I said before, you know, it's only after I, I think I saw uh, Commander David Fravor with uh, Joe Rogan, uh, the podcast of Joe Rogan. Then then I I because I always listen to Joe Rogan in the car, and I listened to that podcast, and it was only. As I said, you know, in 2017, when I when I started to to realize that my own sightings were uh, were maybe more interesting than I thought initially, so I stumbled upon the subject, even though I was flying already for a long time, and that's how I basically started to 
to analyze my own sightings again. But many pilots, they might have not even heard about the whole topic. So I think there's still a lot of uh, uh, terrain to gain here. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for coming and sharing your story. I guess before we leave, um, what are your thoughts about the future? You know, what is your message to people uh, as far as moving forward um, on this topic? Because you're certainly interested and seem to have a vested interest in um, this issue being taken more seriously and the stigma kind of uh, going away. Yeah, but personally, I'm interested mostly uh, because of the flight safety uh, related aspect to it, because I'm uh, as a professional pilot, I'm spending my, my working life in the air and um, uh, I want to know what else is in the air, if it, if it could pose a threat. In general, um, I'm very happy to see that the, the subject is being uh, being brought to attention by professionals like, like Commander David Traver and, and Ryan Graves, and Mr. Elizondo. Uh, and now, especially with the balloon uh, gate <laughs> opening up, I noticed that um, more pilots are becoming interested and the mainstream media is picking it up. So I hope that the subject will uh, lose its its uh, its fringe factor um, because it's 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 so important to keep talking about this. And um, I think, yeah, well, I, I can only hope that, that that the topic will will reach more mainstream uh, media channels and um, hopefully also more professionals, maybe even outside of aviation, uh, will start to speak up and 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 share their uh, uh, their experiences. Thank you so much to Christian for being on the show. Do check out his website and his links. Um, his photography is absolutely gorgeous, so I highly recommend you check that out. But uh, we're very grateful to have him on the show. Um, join us next time in a couple of weeks when we talk more sightings. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you all soon.